All right, everybody. How are we feeling about chemist about uh, finals week? And gonna fail? Nobody's gonna fail this class, right? Everybody's. It's okay to be nervous about that, but Addy. So remember, so with the weighted categories, it's going into the same category as your midterm. So as long as you do the same as you did on the midterm, your grade won't change. That's the advantage of having the weighted categories. It's not total points. So you can get, you can get a, you know, heck, you can get, if you did a 75 on the midterm and you get an 80, your grade will go up, even if you're already sitting at an 89. The, all you have to do is do better than what you did on the midterm and your grade will go up. Okay, Gwen? I'm pulling up Canvas right now to double check, make sure it's the same on here as as what we've been talking about. Um, but yes, it's it is already set up the same weights that I was planning on using. So if you yeah, if you use the what if accurate, yeah. The only thing that'll change is your assignments category might change a little bit as I finish finish um, catching up on all your labs and homeworks and stuff. But if you've been if you've gotten everything turned in at about the same level that you have been in the past, you that percentage probably won't change that much in the next week, right? Unless if you haven't turned anything in since since Christmas break, um, then your grade might drop a little bit. But there's still time to get that stuff turned in. Philip? Okay. All right. So how how does the uh, practice test look? Pretty similar to midterm, right? We need help. Okay, well, that's what next week's for. So the the plan for the next week is, um, sorry, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, and then we had MLK Day on Monday. So we're going to do two lectures in a row today and tomorrow on nuclear chemistry, um, which only really, as scary as that may sound, um, there's only really two types of calculations that you have to do with when it comes to nuclear chemistry. Um, Two types? Yeah, I think two types. Maybe maybe only one. No, two types of calculations. Forgot about half-life. Um, and so we're going to work on those tomorrow. Today's going to be sort of conceptual stuff, vocabulary, learn how to write nuclear reactions and what the different types of reactions are. Um, and then uh, tomorrow we'll practice the calculations. Next week is going to be primarily review and um, chance to work on the practice test, chance to get everything else turned in, put a button on everything, get everything finished up. Uh, and then you'll, and um, there will be two take home problems. That'll be an extra 20 points on the, in the exams category um, to maybe three. I'm debating a third one. It'll depend on how the next few days go. Um, that you'll have access to starting tomorrow. One of the take home problems is going to be an Excel problem where I'm going to make you take some data, graph it, do some calculations, nothing too tricky, just that that's one of the main skills that we practiced a lot in the, in the labs this, this uh, semester, right? So, but I can't really test you on an Excel problem on a timed in class test. So, That'll be a take home problem. And then there'll be one problem solving kind of somewhat tricky system of equations problem where you have to write a few equations, do some substitution, solve for things. Um, probably something kind of similar to remember that that problem from the beginning of the year with the copper spheres and the lead spheres in the box. And how do you tell how many you have of each? Um, it'll probably be something along those lines. Um, probably updated since we've been covering newer materials since then. Um, but those, that's what I'm thinking for two take home problems is stuff that I wouldn't want to spring on you on a timed test, 
um, where you are allowed to work together. We'll talk about the rules for that tomorrow as well. Um, but uh, that'll that's your last assignment in this class. And so you'll have time to work on that in class next week with other people asking questions, that sort of thing. Gwen? They will go in, so you'll have a total of 220 points in the exam category. And 20 of them will be take home, maybe 30. I'm still debating that last problem. If I do, know that it's you, that's to help you in general, because usually people are able to get most of the points on the take home problems right? Um, because you have all the time that you care to spend on it. I realize you have other priorities too. You're not just taking one class, but still you have a lot of time to work on it if you need to. Philip? Yes, either that or we'll work through them on Monday in class. Uh, we, it might just, we might just do it on the fly working together through the problems as you ask them on Monday and Wednesday of next week. Um, but probably... I hesitate to say tomorrow because I'm in meetings all day until I see you tomorrow. Um, but probably sometime tomorrow I'll be able to get get the key written and posted. Okay. Any other questions on scheduling, assignments, that kind of thing? Sydney, you had your hand up for a while. Did I answer your question? Okay. Then are you the future when you do take the final next Friday or Um, if it would be advantageous, then I suppose I can see so different schedule, right? It's minimum day. Yeah. Um, so in the morning, so I, I'm... I don't have committee meetings next week. I don't think every other Friday is six hours straight of meetings until I see you. Um, but that's tomorrow. So next Friday probably will be able to be around, um, if that would be helpful, but you're just gonna be taking the test. Yeah, so sorry. was there another, I saw another hand. I, I hesitate to, so first off, you're going to have two hours instead of hour and a half. So you'll have more time than you did on the midterm. That's about the same length of a test. Um, I hesitate to let you stay too much after that because not everybody has the ability to do that. People have other, other things have to have to get the ride home or they're walking, that kind of thing. So I don't, I don't like to just say take as much time as you want because not everybody has the same ability to do that. So in the interest of fairness, I'm going to try to not to keep everybody to close to the two hour mark unless there's unless you have academic accommodations. Um, if you have some documentation of that, like so and so has gets one and a half times the normal amount of test taking time, um, which I don't know if they do that at the school here that. Yeah, OK. Um, so if you have academic accommodations, then tell me or go through your normal process for scheduling that um, and we'll make that happen. But and if you feel like you should have extra time because you're always on pushing the envelope, I encourage you to go talk to the counselors. Probably they can help you get them some of those academic accommodations if you need that is having that on your record before you get to real college will actually be an advantage because you can go in there knowing hey, I usually get these accommodations, go to the accommodations office, they can help you out um, because we do that kind of stuff at, at, the, at LTCC as well and all major colleges do. So if you do need that extra time or if you're figuring out that you might be one of the people that needs extra time, pursue that maybe not, maybe too late for this quarter but or for this semester, but in the future. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and just before I forget to do that, let me check the weights on all the assignments and everything. No, you get the satisfaction of being one of the first people done. I was I was one of those test takers. I couldn't stand to check my own work at the end of a test. I would finish a test, turn it in, and leave. Um, which I didn't realize until I started teaching that actually throws a lot of people off when somebody finishes really fast. Don't be thrown off if somebody finishes really fast and you're only halfway through the test. Um, odds are that's just how they take tests. So, are the uh, the weights on the tests on the categories 
are 50% for assignments, 20% for, um, 30% for quizzes, 20% for the exams. So this final exam is gonna be roughly 10% of your total grade, but it's going into a category that already has your midterm in it. So like I said, just do better than you did on the midterm, and your grade goes up. Conversely, I suppose if you got a 98 on the midterm, means that your grade's gonna go down unless you get another 98, um, just probably not by very much. So don't stress too much. If you got a 98 on the midterm, that's still an advantage, um, but your grade probably will drop a little bit more. All right, let's talk about nuclear chemistry. So I know we've mentioned the term in here a few times, um, and you may have seen it a little bit in, in your other chemistry courses. What does nuclear chemistry mean? Yeah, the term nuclear literally comes from the nucleus. It's a, nu a nuclear reaction means that the nucleus is changing, as opposed to most of our chemical reactions, which we're just moving atoms around, maybe electrons around, but the nucleus, um, all of the nuclei are still the same, right? So basically balancing nuclear reactions gets a little bit wonky because you're not counting a number of carbon atoms before and after. For nuclear reactions, you were looking typically at making sure we have the same number of nucleons before and after. And a nucleon is anything that's in the nucleus. So a neutron or a proton. In nuclear reactions, you'll have the same number of nucleons before and after, but what they are, what your atoms are, is going to be changing. Right. And so we'll start with a little bit of history because it is kind of a, one, it's a fairly new field. So uh, we actually have a, a pretty good history. Um, a guy named Becquerel uh, was the first person to notice that some, he was actually trying to study fluorescence and how different, different elements would glow when you shine wavelengths of light on them. Um, and he was trying to design an experiment to see if some materials um, would get give off x-rays. Although he didn't really start doing that. He really started because he um, there was a, a class of materials that they knew glow, glowed in the dark. They didn't quite know why. They thought it had to do with phosphorescence. But he had a rock, basically, just sitting on his desk. And it was a rock that when you shine UV light on it, it would glow. So he kind of just had it because he um, wasn't doing, he, he was uh, head of a department rather than actually doing active research for the most part of the time. So he had that rock kind of as a paperweight and he put it on top of it, of an x-ray um, that, uh, that they were using for an unrelated experiment. And when he moved it off of the x-ray, he noticed that it had changed the x-ray. What's the term I'm looking for? Um, the film, negative. the negative, thank you. The negative, the, the black with white on it that you actually get, the sheet of paper, plastic these days, um, it had changed that. And that's actually what this is right here, is here's his paper, his notes, here's where he set the rock. And he noticed that the rock changed the negative of the x-ray. So he started doing all these other experiments, figuring out what was going on with that. Um, and so Becquerel has a unit of, of radioactivity named after him. I believe a Becquerel is the total amount is of absorbed radiation. Radiation units get a little bit weird, depending on whether you're talking about how much is absorbed versus given off. Um, but when you change your, your frame of reference, you use different units. And so, and then, which led to I don't believe Marie Curie was directly his student, but I believe she was at the same university in Paris. Um, and so she's the one we all associate with discovering radioactivity. Um, and radiation was kind of, they kind of used the term radiation kind of interchangeably with radioactivity, which was a little confusing because they were just also figuring out how quantum mechanics 
they were starting to get into how light worked. They weren't truly into the quantum mechanics realm yet, but in the late 1800s, they were starting to figure out that light was related to some of these processes. And so Marie Curie was one who, who kind of went through her, some of her research was literally her going through literal tons of gravel from Africa, picking out certain ores that had lots of uranium in them and then purifying the uranium to run tests on it. Um, so she, she was one who kind of discovered that the radiation was coming from these ores. It was not a byproduct, it was not fluorescence at all. Something else was happening. And so she was, um, she set up lots of types of detectors and tried to figure out different, classify different types of radioactivity. Um, and so she, she's also, there's only, I think there's like three or four scientists in history that have more than one element named after them or by them on the periodic table. And she's one of them. Actually, she has three elements. She discovered two elements herself. Um, and she has a third one named after her. Does anybody know what elements she discovered? Or was named after her? Not radon, radium. So radium is what they used to, they actually used radium in uh, wristwatches, especially during World War II and World War I. They painted radium, used radium-based paints and painted um, on the, uh, the face of the wristwatches um, in order, so that they had glow in the dark wristwatches so they could tell time in the dark. Oh. Cerium is not curium is. Curium I, is 96. Yeah. Um, so curium is the one named after her. She didn't discover that. Um, but she discovered radium and polonium. Polonium is actually named after her homeland, which is not France. Poland. She was Polish. Um, she moved to France when she graduated from high school because in Poland at the time, women weren't allowed to go to university. So she had to move to an entirely different country that she didn't speak the language um, to go take university level classes um, in, in France. And when she finished her, her first degree, her bachelor's degree in, in uh, France, even in France, which was very progressive for the time, women weren't allowed to go to graduate school, weren't allowed to earn doctorates. And so she had to find an advisor, uh, a researcher that would allow her to work with him um, in order to be accepted into, into the graduate school program, um, which is actually where she met. And I, I, the more I think about it, I think it was Becquerel. I think she worked directly with Becquerel um, and met her husband, Pierre, uh, um, as he was a fellow grad student, she shared her first Nobel Prize with Pierre, and she shared her second Nobel Prize with Irene, which I don't actually know how to pronounce it in the French. Um, if anybody speaks French and knows how to pronounce that name, feel free to help me. Um, something close to Irene, but I'm not going to offend anybody by trying to use a French accent when I don't speak French without knowing any better. Um, so Irene went, what became a, uh, a research scientist with her mother and shared this uh, Marie Curie's second prize, Nobel Prize, which was the one in chemistry. Her first Nobel Prize was Nobel Prize in physics for discovering radioactivity and classifying it. And then her second Nobel Prize was for finding, discovering radium and polonium. Have I talked about Marie Curie's daughters here before? So her, her younger daughter um, is not, um, did not grow up to become a scientist. She was a journalist, um, but she is equally badass because she chose, when the rest of her family was evacuated from France when the Nazis invaded in 1940 or so, um, her daughter Eve stayed behind in France and was a member of the French resistance um, during World War II voluntarily. The rest of her family left. Um, to go to America, and she chose to stay behind. And then she went on to um, marry one of the first officials of the UN, 
Um, I believe it was, was it the League of Nations first? That was between World War One and II. Um, the, but one of the first directors of the UN um, was Eve's husband, who won a Nobel Peace Prize um, on his for his work in economic, maybe an economics prize. I think it was a Peace Prize though. So poor Eve, a uh, member of the French resistance, is the only one of her family, including her husband, who didn't win a Nobel Prize in one field or another, um, but still left her her mark. Um. So and she was re really the one that reclassified it instead of being radiation as radioactivity. Because radiation just means what? Just means light. Like that's radiation. It's just not harmful radiation. Microwaves give off radiation. It's just in the infrared. It doesn't actually harm you. It's not radioactive. Radioactive means it's an element that will go through nuclear reactions. All right, so what is radioactivity? Basically, what the first thing they could discover, first thing they, they were aware of, and the reason they called it radiation at first is they were just aware that there were tiny high energy particles, including gamma rays, which is a form of light, that were given off by atoms, some atoms, only some atoms and only some isotopes. Um, so at first, radiation made a lot of sense. And even the particles that weren't light, they tried, they behaved kind of like light because they were very small and they were super high energy. And so they thought, oh, maybe this is just a different type of light because we still don't know what light is, right? We're still figuring out, is it a particle, is it a wave? Maybe it's, it's a particle and this is just heavy light. Um, and, but what they eventually found out is it's really that it's, there's tiny pieces of the nucleus were flying out of the nucleus. So it's part of the atom that was breaking apart and being fired off with close to the speed of light at relativistic speeds with huge amounts of energy along with actual light, gamma rays. And so they were trying to, to establish all of this and figure out what was going on. And so we kind of needed a set of, of um, new terms new vocabulary here. So as we mentioned before, nuclear reactions mean that nucleus is changing one way or another, a nucleus is changing. We'll go through the various types of nuclear reactions here in a minute. But the two biggest categories um, are fission and fusion. So fission is basically the category of, of nuclear reactions where you start with something big and you wind up with something smaller at the end. You take a big chunk and it naturally breaks apart. I'd say naturally we can put it in situations that cause that to happen faster or slower. Um, but in general, if you have a large enough nucleus, it's unstable. And when that unstable nucleus breaks apart, that's a fission reaction. Um, and when you hear about Fissionable material, if you've ever heard that term. Um, we can we have ways, like I said, of sort of putting nuclei into situations that cause this process to happen faster. Um, sometimes that means we, we enrich materials by kind of concentrating certain isotopes, and that can speed up the process. Sometimes it means we, we're taking a, a material and we bombard it with neutrons or other um, particles at the right speed we can get the re we can get it to split open faster than it naturally would or in different ways um, but in general it does occur naturally for pretty much for everything larger than um i saw something earlier today that said there's an isotope of bismuth but um the largest regularly occurring usually we say anything larger than lead is going to be radioactive to some extent Basically, you get beyond a certain size of nucleus, it becomes unstable. And everything above that size, um, about, I think it's 206, maybe that's why bismuth, bismuth might actually be larger than the stable isotopes of lead. Um, 
will everything above that level is going to be radioactive, is going to go through these fission reactions naturally. Fusion also occurs naturally, but not on Earth. Um, fusion is, it occurs naturally when you have enough gravity that you take small nuclei and force them together so close that they stick together and become one nucleus. So if you can picture taking, you know, if you take two ice cubes and you put them in a vise and you squeeze them together to the point where they become one ice cube, it takes a little bit of force to do that, but you can kind of visualize what's happening there. They're not naturally going to stick together. In fact, naturally, they're actually going to repel each other. That's where the ice cube analogy falls apart, but ignore that. Um, naturally, nuclei are positively charged, right? So when you try to force them together, they don't want to be close together. They're going to naturally push each other apart. But if you've got enough gravity pushing things together, enough pressure on those nuclei, you get a fusion reaction. And somebody actually asked me about that in one of the, the quiz questions last week or, from, or the week before. What happens if you put an infinite amount of force on a molecule? Basically, you force atoms into becoming one bigger atom. You get a fusion reaction. Um, and I know I've talked about that what if blog before where people get asked um, physics PhD random questions. Somebody said, what if you, somebody was able to throw a baseball that's at 90% the speed of light? Um, basically, when something is moving that fast, the part, the uh, gas molecules can't move out of the way fast enough. And you would actually start a fusion reaction on the front of the baseball when it starts pushing air molecules out of the way, it can't push them out of the way fast enough and they start fusion reaction um, with the molecules of the baseball. So basically anytime you get big molecule or smaller nuclei and force them together, you can get a fusion reaction to happen. So where does that happen in nature? Stars, Stars the sun. Yeah, in fact, Jupiter is only about a couple, if Jupiter was 10% larger, I want to say, is, is, the, is the estimate, um, then Jupiter would have enough gravity to cause fusion reactions and we would actually be, we probably wouldn't be living, but our solar system would be a binary system with two stars. Jupiter is almost what they call a brown dwarf star um, because it's just about big enough to be the smallest type of star. Um, where does that happen on Earth? Not naturally. Fusion reactors, particle accelerators. Basically, that's one of the ways that we find the new elements is we take smaller pieces and we accelerate them really, really fast in these big particle accelerators and smash them together. And we see if we can make a new element out of it by, by looking at pieces. Um, if you've ever heard the term a th thermonuclear bomb, that's weaponized fusion. That's a fusion bomb. Um, turns out fusion is really, well, not easy. It's not all that difficult with modern technology and the right resources to cause a fusion reaction to happen. It's just really, really hard to get it to happen sustainably in a way we can harvest electricity from it. Um, and that's what a fusion reactor is. Nusa? In the particle accelerator, besides the swam that Alvin Stillings vehicle makes, do um, elements of like what do you mean by C and Nitro? Well, so we basically have recipes for all the all the synthetic elements. Most of the synthetic elements, all of the synthetic elements um, on the periodic table were created in something like a particle accelerator through fusion processes. Um, and so we kind of have a, a recipe for most of them. So to make technetium 90, you take, you take equal parts, this and that, and you squeeze them together at this speed and you get technetium. Yes, but sometimes what happens when you slam them together is you just get lots of smaller pieces. It's a little bit, if you can, if you can picture trying to take um, half of a Lego ball, and half of a Lego ball and throw them at each other and get them to stick together. Most of the time, what's gonna happen is you're going to wind up with them hitting into each other and just blowing apart to pieces. 
sometimes if you did it just right with just the right force and just the right angle, you could get them to actually stick. And that's what a new synthetic element is. And there's certain criteria for it has to last a certain amount of time for it to be considered a stable nucleus. There's probably other elements that have been discovered. We have evidence for them, but they degrade too fast for us to actually measure them. Um, and so it's a matter of how do we do it in the right way so that we get something stable enough we can actually measure it on the other side. But yeah, you're right. You're, you're guaranteed for a split second um, to have a new element, and then it just falls apart, though, sometimes. Um, and when I say new element, I mean something that's not on the periodic table. It would still turn into a new material. It's, we wouldn't think of it as a new element unless it's you know, 119, um, something we haven't seen before. All right, so because fission is the process that happens most in geology and happens most on Earth. Um, and it's really fission, because it happens naturally, um, we can, we can kind of classify it as in terms of these are the types of reactions that happen. And that means we can use that to predict what the product is going to be to some extent. Fusion, that's a lot harder because you kind of have to be told what the products are going to be because it doesn't follow as predictable of rules. When things are falling apart naturally, they tend to go in a couple different patterns. But when you're just when you're going through a fusion process, there's a lot of different routes you can go. Um, so the types of fission, the first type that was that was known um, was alpha particles. That you may remember. You probably don't remember. This was a long time ago, and you didn't know what the term meant at the time. Um, but when you talked about the gold foil experiment, Rutherford's gold foil experiment, where he disproved the plum pudding model, he did that by firing alpha particles, which they didn't even know what they were. They just knew they were particles that had a certain mass. And they naturally came out of a certain radioactive material with a certain speed. Um, those alpha particles are basically a helium nucleus. And so, and a lot of times we'll sit, sometimes we'll write it as alpha. Um, sometimes we'll write it as helium two plus. Um, and just a recap, when it comes to uh, nuclear reactions, when we're talking about counting nucleons, we care a lot about what isotopes we start and end with because we have to add them up to make sure it's balanced. So just a re recap that when we're writing um, nuclear reactions or specific isotopes out, what's that number? The total atomic mass of this particular nucleus, right? So that's protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. What's that number? It's the atomic number. So that one's kind of redundant if you already know what the um, what the atomic symbol is, if you know what element it is, a little redundant, but for the purposes of being able to count stuff up and see what happens when we're doing nuclear reactions, that's one that's actually useful to have that written. Um, and sometimes you'll even see this written. So the, the alpha is just designating that it's not an element, and it is an element kind of, but it's coming from as a result of a nuclear process. So because this is a really common type of, of nuclear reaction, it kind of gets its own atomic symbol a little bit. Um, I typically will use this, but I want you to know that an alpha particle is a helium nucleus with no electrons, which is one of the reasons why certain ty this type of radiation is so dangerous, right? You have something flying close to the speed of light with a fairly large mass compared to light compared to photons with a positive charge that's super unstable, if you hit something living with alpha particles, you're going to start tearing through cell membranes, proteins, um, genomes. You're going to start basically breaking stuff apart because this is not stable on its own and it's moving real fast. Um, we'll go through examples for all of these. Um, I'm just going to talk about them real quick so you have your, on your list. Um, beta particles are basically an electron. They have the same mass as an electron. 
they don't have they don't have any protons or neutrons so they don't count when we're counting nucleons they have a negative charge though and they also are flying really really fast when they come out of a nucleus um why the heck do we get an electron flying out of the nucleus though that seems weird right there are no electrons in the nucleus are there No, good question. It's not one of the, if you count the number of electrons for something goes through a beta emission, um, you actually wind up with a new electron. You get an extra, extra electron, but the charge still has to balance. So if we had something like, uh, let's see, nitrogen 12. Do that right? No. Carbon 14. We'll go through a beta emission. You wind up with an extra electron. And but your so your total number of of uh, nucleons didn't change. So whatever we get over here is also mass of 14. And the overall charge can't change. So if you lost an electron from the nucleus, what do you know about what has to be true about the nucleus? Close, one extra proton. Basically, beta emission happens when you, you turn a neutron into a proton. It turns out a proton and a, and a neutron are both made up of three quarks. One, uh, one of them is two spin up quarks and one spin down quark and the other one is one spin up and two spin down. And if you flip one of the spin up to spin down, it fires off an electron. The process of turning one quark from spin up to spin down creates an electron out of nothing not out of nothing, out of the, the energy that it takes to make that switch. And so we actually can change a neutron to a proton by doing that. Still has close to the same mass, but the charge changed. And as a result, you lose an electron from the nucleus because electrons don't belong in the nucleus. Next one's even cooler. Positron emission is basically the opposite of beta emission. A positron emission is when certain molecules will actually fire off an electron with a positive charge. So it's basically the opposite. When you have a neutron, instead of a neutron turning to a proton, if you have a proton turned to a neutron, you get a, something with the mass of an electron with a charge of one, but it's a plus one. Does anybody know what you call matter that has opposite charges to normal matter? Antimatter. So we actually can observe antimatter forming naturally in certain radioactive materials. Materials that give off positrons. A positron is a positive electron. Basically, that's what antimatter is. Antimatter is matter that has all the same properties of regular matter, but the charges on everything are flipped. So your protons are negative and your electrons are positive, which is weird to us. Um, but it turns out there's likely entire galaxies made up of antimatter that where everything behaves the same way as what we have, but with opposite charges. Does anybody know what happens when antimatter runs into regular matter? They cancel each other out. They disappear. And that mass that did exist when the antimatter runs into the matter, that mass just turns into pure energy, which is also weird. And we'll talk about how we can calculate that. It turns out that's a really, really exothermic process, um, even more so than regular nuclear reactions. Um, the last two, electron capture 
Electron capture is, is what you get if you have an unstable nucleus that's really, really heavy with really, really high charge. Those 1s electrons that are right there, right next to the surface of the nucleus, because they're getting pulled really, really tightly by all the protons in there. And sometimes they can basically steal an electron. So this is the opposite of, of Jay's guess about the beta particles and knocking off its own electron. They eat their own electron, basically. And they absorb an electron, which turns a proton into a neutron. Basically, one electron sticks to a proton, and it flips one of those quarks from up to down, and you get a neutron out of it. And then last but not least is that kind of least because it's the one that's not actually a nuclear reaction. Gamma radiation is literally just a byproduct of the rest of these. When you have a, a reaction happen, we've already seen this a little bit in some of our reactions, right? If you have a reaction that happens all at once, like an electron moving from a high energy level to a low energy level, and it needs to give off all of its energy at once, what does it do? What happens when the electron goes from, it turns to light, right? When an electron drops an energy level, it has to give off all that energy at once, right? It doesn't have time to give it off as heat slowly. It has to, to create all of that energy at once for that process to happen instantaneously. So a photon is generated that has the same amount of energy. Y'all remember doing that, right? Doing the energy calculations um, for the different colors of light. Well, nuclear reactions still have that same issue. A process, a reaction happens instantaneously and you need to release energy all at once. And so but generally speaking, it does that by creating a photon and usually really, really high energy photons well above um, the visible spectrum, which is why you get X-rays and gamma rays are really high energy photons that are typically only created. X-rays we can create other ways now, but gamma rays are really only created by nuclear reactions because that's pretty much the only process that can create photons that are that high energy. Um, now that we understand how photons are generated by changing energy levels, we can actually just tune this gap in materials to make it so we can make photons of whatever wavelength we like. So we don't actually use radioactive materials in doctor's offices anymore when it comes to um, taking x-rays. We just have basically a light, an LED, where the wavelength of the LED is really, really high. It's in the, the x-ray category. So we can artificially generate x-rays. There's not really a whole lot of reason to do that for gamma rays. We probably could, but there, since there's no application, I don't think anybody's really looked into it. And now we use electronic detectors instead. So um, if you, I remember going to the dentist's office when I was, when I was, I don't know, probably seven was the memory that I have. Um, and they had these little sharp plastic film negatives that you had to put in your mouth. Um, that I felt were always cutting the inside of my mouth and I could never hold it just the way that the dentist wanted it to be. Or So they always had to do like six or seven times. Um, I'm really glad that we don't have those anymore. We have those nice rounded edge. They're bigger things, but those plastic detectors with the cord on them that you use now, um, that's because we're using electronic detectors. Um, it's the equivalent of switching over from film photography to digital photography. Good question. Why do x-rays still have a risk of causing cancer, if, even if they're not coming from radioactive materials? Because there's still high energy enough photons that they can knock electrons off of um, important molecules in your body. So if you happen to have a mutation happen in your, in your cheek or something like that, um, because you got a whole bunch of radiation, it's there's a good, decent chance that that's because you had a whole bunch of radiation going through your cheek cells to take these, these dental x-rays. Um, and if, it, if a high energy photon happens to knock an electron off of a DNA molecule that's then replicated incorrectly, that can cause a, a genetic mutation. And nine, 
nine times out of 10, let's say 90 times out of 100, a genetic mutation is this called a silent mutation. It means you never notice any difference to it in your body, in your lifetime. Nine times out of 100, um, you wind up causing cancer basically by one form or another. Basically, it shuts off some of the promoter regions or damages some of the machinery that replicates your DNA. And that cell no longer knows how to stop replicating itself. Um, and then the hundredth time, it's probably more like the one out of 10 million time, you get some other genetic mutation that might be able to be passed down to offspring or something like that um, in the form of something like um, a cool superpower, like having six fingers. Um, I, it's kind of it's kind of a joke given that rate how radiation gets like oh got exposed to radiation and now he's the Hulk. Um, no, more than likely he gets leukemia, and maybe his distant descendants have some genetic abnormality that might be an advantage in the future. I know. Don't go exposing yourself to radiation in hopes you're going to get superpowers because you're just going to get sick. <laughs> All right, so here's we got the, the figures that have some of the balanced reactions um, with some real world examples. So here's here's an example of what well, it's just a cartoon. It's not really what it would look like. But uranium 238 is a naturally occurring uranium isotope that naturally on its own over time will degrade into thorium-234 and an alpha particle. Basically, you pull four nucleons out of the uranium. You pull two protons and two neutrons out of uranium and look on the periodic table. What's two atomic numbers less than uranium is thorium. And then, and typically these go through a series of processes. You wind up with uranium-238 turns to 234. Uranium-234 two, or thorium-234 emits an alpha particle and becomes, uh, was that radium? Radium-230. Uh, and you can, and then maybe that one goes through a beta mission and it changes and goes from being radium to being actinium. And then actinium loses an alpha particle. We get these sort of series, these cascades of processes that happen. Um, and the end result though, is that over time, uranium-238 turns to, will end at a stable isotope of lead. Lead 204 maybe? Um, yeah. That's more of a function of its density. Turns out anything that's dense enough you can use to block radiation. Um, we use lead because not only is it really dense, it's also really cheap. Um, but anything you could use, you know, tungsten or bismuth or something like that as a radiation shield as well. But why when lead is so easy to work with and plentiful? Water is a good, Water's a good one, especially for the lighter forms of radiation. We'll go, I'm on the wrong computer. Um, so here's an example that looks at how different types of radiation can penetrate different depths of, of materials. So this is for pieces of lead in particular, um, but just a piece of lead that's a hundredth of a millimeter thick is enough to stop alpha particles because alpha particles are so big. But beta particles, those high energy electrons, go through that. But if you have a millimeter thick lead, that's enough to stop beta particles. If it's not enough to stop gamma radiation, it'll stop some of the gamma radiation, um, but 100 millimeters, so 10 centimeters of lead, is still not enough to stop all of the gamma radiation. Which is why that little vest that they put on you at the dentist's office is not really stopping very much. Because um, that's not 10 centimeters of lead thick, right? Um, which is also why they have the doctor or the person taking the x-rays leave the room because they're doing that 50 times a day. Um, and so their radiation exposure builds up a lot faster 
than if you're going in once every six months. Once every six months for dental x-rays is less radiation absorbed in your body, even without the protective vest, um, than you would get from just going on a, on a walk um, at our altitude. A 10 minute walk in direct sunlight is probably more radiation absorbed um, than, than what you would get from dental x-rays every six months. Not really. Um, I mean, I guess to some extent, we call that getting a tan, um, but not, not in terms, not long-term really. It's not something that our bodies, a tolerance is basically your body adapting to routine stresses that you put on it, right? We don't really have any ability to adapt to, um, I'm just gonna periodically come in and destroy 10% of your cells um, other than making more cells, which is how you get cancer. Um, so not, there's not really something you can do, not anything you do to fix that. It's just kind of be like, be like building up a tolerance to car crashes. All right. So we'll talk about more about how these, these things happen in processes in a second. Ah, I did get it right. Um, so beta decay, I had it listed as a type of vision, but really it can happen to any, any radioactive isotope. Um, and we'll talk about how to know whether certain types are more likely than others to occur. But if you have a mismatch in the number of neutrons to protons, that's typically when a nuclear reaction is going to happen. In the case of beta decay, if you have too many neutrons relative to the number of protons you have, well, the way to get that balance back is to take one of those neutrons and turn it into a proton. So especially at the smaller elements, most of the stable isotopes have, it, have about a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons. Um, that's not, that's something we can kind of explain by looking at the strong and weak nuclear force and what's called nuclear binding energy. But basically the neutrons there kind of mediate and keep the protons from pushing each other away. They kind of act as, I won't call it the glue because a gluon is a totally different thing. Um, but they basically act to balance out the strong and weak nuclear force so that you get a stable isotope. If you don't have the right ratio of protons to neutrons, you get an unstable nucleus, which will go through some form of radio radioactivity, radioactive decay. So the most common form when you have too many neutrons relative to your protons is a beta particle emission, because that has the net result of changing that ratio without changing the mass. Right, so uh, nitrogen 14 is totally stable. Carbon-14 is not because of that mismatch in the ratio of neutrons to protons. On the flip side, if you have the opposite, if you don't have enough neutrons, if you have too many protons, you can get a positron reaction, a positron emission happening because a positive, that's gonna basically do the opposite. If, if a beta emission is gonna take a neutron, turn it to a proton, positron emission takes a proton and turns it to a neutron. All right, and so the net result is you didn't change your total number of nu nucleons, it's 30 before and 30 after in this example, but, now we're closer to a, a better ratio. You'll notice it's it was one to one before, right? Phosphorus 30 is one proton for every neutron. It is as we get to larger and larger nuclei, that one to one ratio doesn't hold for everything. As we get larger and larger, it becomes more like 1.6 neutrons for every proton. So you need extra neutrons relative to the number of protons. And there comes a point where there is no stable ratio of protons to neutrons. And that's what happens once you get past lead.
once you get past the mass of about 208, um, 208 nucleons, there is no stable ratio. And that's why everything is, is radioactive past lead. Um, the same net effect, electron capture is really the same thing. Same, sorry, same net effect, but it doesn't generate antimatter. If you you have a really big nucleus like ruthenium 92, it can steal an electron from its surroundings and kind of incorporate it into the nucleus, which has the net result of taking a proton and making it a neutron. Positron emission, you can kind of think of it as a proton loses its positive charge. And so and if a proton has the same mass as a proton, but doesn't have a positive charge, what is it? It's a neutron. Um, and if electron capture is sort of the opposite, where you can take an electron and force it onto a proton and make it a neutron. Right, and so here's here's your example, Musa, of one of the one of the ways we can make a synthetic element, and how we can do it reliably. If you start with ruthenium ninety two and you fire electrons at it, you can turn it into technetium ninety two, which is itself radioactive, but maybe with a longer half life or la would la at least last long enough for you to be able to measure its um, measure its properties. Did we talk about technetium forming naturally? It would have been a long time ago. All four, did they use this at all to treat nuclear waste uh, to make it safer? That might be an avenue that people are looking at. Um, I don't think it's hap happened in the past because traditionally um, America in particular and humanity in general I've always taken the approach of we're just going to bury it and let the next generation deal with it. Um, so I don't, most nuclear waste is not treated. It's buried in the middle of Nevada or uh, Utah, um, which turns out may eventually cause problems. Who'd have thought? Well, the thing is, if you do it on the land that's owned by the poorest and indigenous peoples left on the continent, then there's very few people left to complain about it. Um, it's kind of why Nevada, the middle of Nevada was chosen, um, just because it's it's an example of anybody heard of NIMBYism? Does anybody know what NIMBY means? Not in my backyard. NIMBYism means basically out of sight, out of mind. Um, as long as we don't bury nuclear waste close to where the rich people live, then it's fine because they're the ones who speak up and have the power. But now we're diverting too much into economics and politics. So I'll leave that alone. Um, but that's definitely part of the reason why we treat nuclear waste the way we do, or don't, as the case may be. Um, oh, technetium. So technetium is best known as being the first synthetic element because it's not it doesn't occur naturally on earth since we've been looking for it. It probably was part formed in the early solar system naturally as part of the supernova that formed our solar system. Um, however, technetium's most stable isotopes still have a half-life of something in the tens of thousands of years. And since our solar system is four and a half billion years old, uh, they're basically all the technetium was gone before we knew to look for it. It does occur naturally, just not on Earth. It occurs naturally in, during star formation and during supernovas, and then just all breaks apart and, and decays over time. Um, and a lot of the synthetic elements are like that. We call them the synthetic elements because we only found, didn't find them on Earth when we knew to be looking, but they probably do form um, in in supernova formation or um, over the course of a supernova. All right, and then here's just a slide on gamma radiation, which again is just the light that comes from the nucleus when you have another nuclear reaction happening. So you're pretty much never gonna see gamma radiation occur on its own. It's always gonna be coupled with some other form of radioactivity. Uh, and so usually we don't write it 
as part of the reaction process because you can't balance it. Just like we can't balance, you know, if we had N2 plus 3H2 goes to two ammonia. If we, if we have to put energy in to do that, we can't really balance the energy part, right? We have to have, that's why we don't usually write it like that. We would write it as delta H equals, I don't know, positive 72 kilojoules per mole. The same thing with our gamma radiation. There's going to be a change in energy associated with these nuclear processes. But one, it's not chemical bonds that are changing, so we can't call it enthalpy anymore. Remember, enthalpy specifically meant change in the amount of energy stored in chemical bonds. Well, no chemical bonds are changing. The nucleus itself is changing. So we don't call it delta H when it's a nuclear reaction. One of the ways that they write that, and, and this is really more historical, like I said, since that was how they first discovered radioactivity, was the fact that some things glowed and they didn't know why. And it was because it was a byproduct of these naturally occurring processes. So if that's the case, how do we actually know how much energy is, is being given off? Does anybody have any guesses? Natural log, because it's complicated? It decays with time. The rate is going to involve natural log. The rate of decay, and everybody's heard that term half-life. I just use the term half-life. We'll talk about the math behind that tomorrow. Um, and we'll do more examples with this tomorrow. But it turns out, if you actually look we have this reaction balanced in terms of the number of nucleons, right? We still have the same, in this case, we still have the same number of protons before and after. We have the same number of neutrons before and after. But it turns out if you add up the masses of these pieces, it's not the same mass before and after. There's a measurable difference in the amount, in the weight of a helium nucleus and a thorium-234 nucleus is different mass than uranium-238. Do you know any equations that involve mass and energy? E equals mc squared, bingo. That's right. This is actually in chemistry specifically. Um, more accurately, we, we typically write it as delta E equals delta M, speed of light squared. Whatever your mass is, final mass minus your initial mass times the speed of light squared. And your final mass minus your initial mass has to be in the right units. In order to turn it into joules, your mass has to be in, in kilograms. And your speed of light has to be in meters per second squared. But if you have a change in mass in terms of kilograms times the speed of light squared, you get delta E for the reaction. And sometimes it winds up being a really big number. See if I have one, but I know where there's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. There's one. Here's a good example. Just because this is a fun, fun way to actually do a practice problem that will allow you to solve number 10 on the practice test. Um, and because it makes a really important point. Uranium-235 will spontaneously split. It'll go through a more, a bigger category of fission reaction where instead of just doing the alpha decay, it'll actually break apart into two pieces, um, including three more neutrons. So if you take uranium-235 and you fire a neutron on it, into it, and that neutron hits the nucleus and lodges into the nucleus, the whole thing breaks apart. And if you look at the mass before and after, it's not the same. The mass of the reactants is 236.052588 AMU. 
and our mass after is 235.86769 AMEM. Which, again, AMU is the same as grams per mole, right? So well, what is our delta M in terms of grams per mole? One eight four eight nine. Yeah, that's good enough. So we can either take take AMU and convert it to kilograms, get the energy for this happening once. But we, since our reactions don't usually happen once, let's put it in kilograms per mole. That's just going to be divided by a thousand, right? One point eight four eight nine times 10 to the minus four kilograms per mole. So what is delta E for that reaction? Looks like a pretty small number, right? How is this possibly gonna wind up being significant? Because the speed of light is what? Two th 2.998 times 10 to the eight meters per second, and you're gonna square that. So you're gonna get something like nine times 10 to the 18, sorry, nine, nine times 10 to the 16 times this mass. 1.8489, 10 to the minus four times about 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second squared. This is kilograms per mole. Speed of light's a constant. It's on your, your conversion sheet with more sig figs. So, but that means we're gonna get, so if this is nine times 10 to the 16, call that one times 10 to the 17 times, two times 10 to the minus four, that's still gonna give us something like 10 to the 13, right? Two times 10 to the 13-ish. The one sig fig, it's about right. Does anybody plug it in the calculator? You get a different number? Just double check me, you don't have to. If I'm wrong, let me know which we don't do things in joules per mole. We typically do it in kilojoules per mole for chemical reactions, right? But that's still gonna be two times 10 to the 10 kilojoules per mole, which is, so 10 to the six is a million, 10 to the nine is a billion. It's 20 billion kilojoules per mole. Compared to most of our chemical reactions, like a combustion reaction might be 2000 kilojoules per mole. So we're like seven orders of magnitude larger than a combustion reaction per mole. In in Oppenheimer, do they uh, do they have Einstein writing the letter to FDR? Is that in the movie? They speak about it. They don't show. It. So in it's a big part of the Manhattan Project and getting Manhattan Project started and getting the funding for it in a time when all available funding was going towards fighting World War II, um, the way they got so much money dedicated towards making atomic bombs is because Albert Einstein, along with a bunch of other really, really prominent Nobel Prize winning scientists, like most of the ones who went on to work on the Manhattan Project, wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt um, saying, hey, We've run the numbers and run the numbers and run the numbers, and we keep getting these absurd numbers for just how much energy this bomb will release. Um, and we should really figure this out before the Germans do, because the Germans had a lot of prominent quantum mechanics, um, quantum physicists working for them as well. Um, so they, it became sort of part of lore, and I'm, that, that letter is in a museum somewhere. Um, because it was such an important part of getting the funding for the Manhattan Project. And it's because all of these 
physicists started looking at this number and saying, that can't be right. Did you get that number too? Yeah, I got that number too. Is that, is that, can that be right? And they started working through it and like, no, that's right. Um, we potentially could make something seven trillion times, not seven trillion times, um, 10 to the seven times more powerful than any bomb humanity has ever made. Um, if we can figure out this process and we'd better do it quickly. So most open data because come with gamma rays, it's like- Yeah, so this energy, if you're trying to release that much energy all at once, even if you do the energy for a single atom, this happening once, it's still a measure, it's not quite measurable as one, but it's a very large amount. Um, and when you release that energy all at once, um, if we've done this in not kilograms per mole, so we take this and we divide by Avogadro's number, we'll get kilojoules per atom. And if we take that, we can figure out the wavelength of light that's given off, and it winds up being something in the X-ray or gamma ray range. So it's just that when you release all of this energy at once, it comes out as high energy photons. So let's talk a little bit about, I already talked about that. This is sort of a, when you're doing your studying um, and you wanna check your notes, this is a good sort of recap slide, the different types, the different classifications of reactions. Um, and remember that if you go to week, the work week 14 button on the canvas shell, these slides are posted so you don't have to take a picture of it. It might be a low resolution. Um, go to the PDFs that I post and you can get that and print it off for yourself for studying or study it from your computer that way. Um, and the one that's not on here though, is the one I was just talking about. If you happen to have certain, there it is. Certain reactions don't necessarily follow that pattern. They still act reliably to do the same thing every time, but they don't follow alpha decay beta emission, positron emission, they kind of release all of the energy at once instead of over a series of, of slower reactions. Um, and so that's what we call a, a fission reaction. They're all technically fission reactions, anything where you wind up with two nuclei that are smaller than what you started with. Um, but a lot of times you wind up with sort of bigger chunks on the other end. Um, the other part of this reaction that winds up being really important in terms of making a bomb this way, but also in terms of avoiding having your nuclear power plant turn into a nuclear bomb, is the fact that we started this process because the uranium-235 atom got hit with a neutron and that caused it to break apart like that. And you'll notice, in addition to making a barium nucleus and a krypton nucleus, it also made three more neutrons. If, though, if you have a big enough chunk of uranium so that those three neutrons also can hit another uranium, if they get lodged, if they get stuck inside your big chunk of uranium, then those neutrons don't just escape, they start another reaction, right? Because if you can, you can imagine if this uranium nucleus is surrounded with a huge number of other uranium nuclei, those three neutrons are likely to get stuck into another uranium nucleus and have this happen again. And you start sort of this chain reaction with exponential growth, where every time it happens once, it happens three more times, and then it happens nine times, and then it happens nine to the three, 27, no, 81 times. Nine to the three is more than that. Um, No, nine times, yeah, 27, then 81. Either way, you wind, and that's what causes it to be a nuclear bomb, is having a large enough mass that you capture more of the neutrons than you, than you lose. Does anybody know what the term for that is? When you have a big enough mass that you start a chain reaction. It actually has entered pop culture for meaning other things now too. Did you raise your hand or no? It's critical mass. 
the term critical mass, which is basically just means you have enough momentum to cause something to keep happening. We use it, you see it all the time for social justice movements and protests and things like that. Um, one protest is just a protest, but if that protest carries over enough energy that it can start more protests, that's called that's reaching critical mass and you get a self-sustaining movement instead of just one protest. That term gets used all the time and it comes from the Manhattan Project. All right. More about this tomorrow.